Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage founding executive director, Dr. Gail Reamer. Almost good afternoon. It's wonderful, a genuine blessing to be here today to welcome you on behalf of the Jewish Women's Archive Board and Event Committee and to join with you in honoring three passionate advocates for women. Thank you, Mary, for being with us again this year and for opening today's program with Debbie Friedman's Hear Our Voices. In its final verse, if you listened, but I think you have it in front of you, the song makes reference to our roles as both teachers and students, learning to hear the voices that have been inaudible, joining our own voices to them, and passing this rich legacy along to future generations. A short few months ago, we lost one of our great teachers, the Jewish feminist activist historian Paula Hyman. A pioneer in the field of Jewish women's history, Paula taught us where to find and how to interpret that history, regularly challenging her fellow historians to see what they were missing when they ignored the experiences and perspectives of women. Her spirit and her values are at the heart of today's luncheon theme, making trouble, making history. On what was supposed to be a sunny morning, and um, maybe it will get there still, so that you could sit looking out at Ellis Island and the statue which owes so much of its soul to Emma Lazarus's words. Today we will be honoring three women who, like Lazarus, have challenged our nation and our people to live up to their ideals. More will be said about these three extraordinary women later in the luncheon and more will be said of Lazarus and her legacy in the forum that will be held from 2.30 to 4 in the auditorium downstairs. The forum will be an opportunity to hear Jewish Women's Archive board member and Brandeis University professor Joyce Antler, president of American Jewish World Service Ruth Messenger, and Jewish Women Archive's director of public history Judith Rosenbaum, explore the relatively unknown legacy of Emma Lazarus. I'd like to thank the Museum of Jewish Heritage for co-sponsoring the program and, of course, for hosting us today in this special room with a view. In 1994, I began working on Beginning Anew, the second anthology of women's commentary on the Bible that I co-edited with my colleague, Judith Cates. Shortly into that project, I had one of those classic aha moments. I've come to believe that it was actually a delayed reaction to my reading of Deborah Golda and me. Suddenly I saw with astonishing clarity that while we were toiling to construct full narratives of women in the Bible out of mere fragments, we were preserving nothing more than fragments, if that much, of the lives of women in our own time. That aha marked the beginning of a new calling in my life ensuring that the next generation of scholars, educators, clergy, parents, and students would have ready access to the sources they needed to tell the whole story of our times, to tell a story which put equal value on the thoughts and deeds of women and men. For the last 15 years, Jewish Women's Archive has been filling in more and more of those fragmented narratives, uncovering and making known stories uh, known stories of 19th century Jewish women like Western pioneer Fanny Brooks and Ray Frank, known in her time as the girl rabbi of the Golden West, and early 20th century women like Lillian Walls, an advocate for the city's impoverished immigrants who pioneered public health nursing. Women whose stories, a few of which are highlighted in the center of your program booklet, begin to make whole this museum's exhibits on westward migration, on the great migration to America, on religious innovation, and on the struggle for civil rights. But there are not just fragments to be made whole, there are whole missing chapters. For example, the impact of Jewish women on second wave feminism and of Jewish feminism on the Jewish community. 
We started writing that chapter several years ago when we created our online exhibit, Jewish Women and the Feminist Revolution. The curatorial approach was unusual. We didn't decide on the story in advance, and we didn't just ask Gloria Steinem to tell it to us. We did ask Gloria and 99 other Jewish women prominent in the American women's movement and or in Jewish feminism to send us artifacts from their private collections, which they thought critical to understanding this historical chapter. 74 of them responded. Several of them are in this room today, including two whom you'll, you will soon see on this podium. An important and colorful chapter in the unfolding story of Jews in America, the feminism exhibit is but one slice of the story of American Jewish women who've been making history. It was always our intention to build from this exhibit and fill in other missing chapters. Today, we are kicking off this broader collecting initiative and laying the foundation with artifacts and stories from our three honorees. On the screen, you'll see a sneak preview of what's to come. You'll have to go to the website to read what they have written on Jewish women's humor, symbolic statements, feisty mothers-in-laws. But for now, I'd like you to just think about the difference it will make to our children and our grandchildren to have access to a growing online collection that foregrounds Jewish women's invaluable contributions to our community and country. Look to your right and your left and imagine a collection that captures the stories in this room and in rooms like it in big cities and small towns across the nation. Such a collection would add critical rich richness and texture to the chronicle of Jewish experience, enabling future generations of Jewish women and girls to understand who they are and where they came from, and empowering them not simply to resist being shoved to the back of the bus or barred from the public square, but to insist on being all that they want to be. And it would serve to educate Jewish men and boys as well. You might be asking, how will you build such a collection? This project requires not only our wonderfully talented staff, but visionary and generous partners like you. If you're interested in being part of this effort, I encourage you to talk to a Jewish Women's Archive board member or staff member later today. Donors are essential partners in our efforts to uncover, chronicle, and transmit this rich history. So too are educators. We know of more than 800 teachers who use Jewish Women's Archive materials in their classrooms. And those are just the ones who are in touch with us, um, not the ones who have downloaded materials. We've been providing them with a growing body of lesson plans and curricula, and we run an annual summer institute for which admission is nearly as competitive as to Harvard to provide them with tools to enhance students' use of our online resources. Which brings me to an especially meaningful part of today's program, the presentation of the Natalia Tversky Educator Award endowed by my father to honor my mother's memory. When she arrived in this country in 1945, having survived Auschwitz, my mother had every reason to abandon all she had been taught in her observant home in Krakow, Poland. But that is not what she chose to do. Though she had lost any simple faith and orthodox practice, she remained steadfast in her belief in Jewish education. My nine cousins and I all went to Jewish schools and Jewish camps because my mother insisted that we needed to know who we were and where we had come from. Ever grateful for her decision, I am so pleased that the Jewish Women's Archive can now honor her memory with an annual prize to a Jewish educator. It's most fitting that the lesson which garnered Alison Matana the inaugural Natalia Tversky Educator Award is one that, among other things, would enable her students to appreciate my mother's particular heroism. I don't know enough of my mother's story, but I do know that it was her position as a capo that enabled her to save the lives of numbers of women in Auschwitz. 
While many capos were cruel agents of the SS, some, like my mother, exercised their power humanely, using the little extra food they would sometimes get to strengthen the weakest among their fellow prisoners. The lesson Allison created for her students from material on our website brings together the brings together the two queens of the Purim story, Vashti and Esther, with the story of three women active in the early 20th century labor movement, Clara Lemlich, Pauline Newman, and Rose Schneiderman, women who fought to prevent tragedies like the Triangle fa Fire Factory from ever happening again. Allison asked her students to consider how these activists achieved their goals and what it means to make change by working within the system as Queen Esther did or against it as Queen Vashti did. Too much of Holocaust literature paints capos and partisans in black and white. When Allison's students encounter these and other instances of overt and covert resistance, I feel confident that they will have a nuanced understanding of the choices people make. It gives me great pleasure to invite Allison to join me on the podium. Thank you. Go Thank you, Gail, for those touching remarks. Cool award for teaching American Jewish women's history lesson flashed in my inbox in November 2011. A message from the principal of the Kesher School of Congregation Beit Tikva about, about the Natalia Tversky Educator Award from the Jewish Women's Archives. I was already familiar with the archives and had incorporated a video linked there into a previous lesson. So when Debbie Rosenberg emailed me about the award, I responded immediately that I was interested. Finally, I came up with the materials for the lesson I submitted entitled, Who Will You Be? Esther's and Vashti's in the Labor Movement. The materials I printed from the JWA site were easy for the children to read. The pictures are vivid and the text is well written. I love the citations at the end of each page. It made citing the work so much easier even for a confirmed technophobe like me. The children were very engaged with the materials. Thank you again, JWA, for this honor. A big thank you to Debbie for encouraging me to apply. Thank you to the children in my class, including my own daughter, who are a joy to be with every Sunday, and to Rabbi Liz Bolton and all of the parents and congregants of our small community at Congregation Big Tikva, who are always eager to help and really make wonderful things happen. And thank you to my loving partner, Jonathan, and children, Jeremy and Nadia, who support me in my teaching, even though I have a full-time career as an attorney and, a little, and little time left as a mother and partner. We're all very grateful. Allison, thank you for introducing your students to a few important women in our heritage and along the way to helping them understand that women as well as men can make history and that there are many ways to speak truth to power. One last thing. We've just completed a new video for our website. It answers a lot of questions about what we do and we want you to be the very first ones to see it. It will go live on the site um, right after this event. We also want to hear your thoughts, reactions, and questions. Share these with your table mates and use the envelopes on your table to share them with us. Or just talk to staff or board members after the event. We'd love to get to know you and hear your ideas. And don't forget to eat your lunch. <laughs>